In the entry in which it talks about dying of asphyxiation 30 seconds after being thrown out of a spaceship, it goes on to say that what with space being the size it is, the chances of being picked up by another craft within those seconds are 2 to the power of 260,199 to 1 against. Good evening. I hope you're doing well. As a species, we've always been closely associated with the ideas of going bigger and achieving more. It makes sense. Our ancestors would have benefited from hoarding resources and gaining power. The desire to attain more things, or in its purest form, make numbers go up, has been ingrained into us through time and evolution. Thus, it's no surprise that certain people, especially mathematicians, have dabbled in the realm of the super-huge over the course of human history. So what counts as the first truly large number? And what is the current largest number, and how do you even define that? You can't just add one to the current largest number to get a new record, right? That'd be cheating. How much bigger does your number have to be to be named the new biggest number? Obviously, there's a lot to unpack here, and we will get to it. But we have to take the long route if we want to get a good understanding, so strap in. This is just the epitome of that one joke. In this four and a half hour video essay, I'm going to explore why Spongebob is, uh, you know, a really good show. Part 1. Early Cinema, 1894 to 1904. Also, before we begin, this video is sponsored by... Nothing, I just wanted to make it. Counting has existed since the dawn of Homo sapiens in the form of the fingers on our hands. If you take a close look at your hands, you may notice that you have 10 fingers in total. This is the main reason why the most common base for counting has been base 10 for practically all of human history. It's impossible for us to know in what ways early humans counted with their hands, or if they used some other physical or verbal action to represent counting, since those things obviously couldn't be preserved in any way. But if you're an ancient human, with no specialized tools, an easy way to make your mark in the world is to make a mark. The earliest preserved physical evidence of counting exists in the form of marked bones, the oldest of which is the Labombo bone, dated to between 43 and 44,000 years old. The Labombo bone is the calf bone of a baboon in size to a 29 notches. We have no idea what the notches represent, possibly some sort of animal kill counter or maybe a lunar phase counter as the period of lunar phases is just over 29 days. There exist a few other discovered bones with notches around this time, most of which were likely used to tally animal kills. The later Ashango bone, a small bone with a piece of quartz affixed to one end dating to around 20,000 years ago, contains 168 notches ordered in three distinct columns. It's widely debated what the notches mean, as they are separated into groups. Some believe it represents a lunar calendar, while others believe the notches were used for simple arithmetic. This basic tally system later evolved into other methods, such as sticks and strings, but it wasn't until the invention of writing around 3400 BC that a clear basis for mathematics began to form. Udre! As the Sumerians began developing the earliest forms of written language in the form of clay tablets, so too did they write their own numeral system. They counted in base 60, or sexagesimal, the reason for which is still not fully known. In oral counting, as in using written words to denote numbers, the Sumerians used the word gez, meaning unity, to denote 60. This word could then be combined with other numbers to denote multiples of 60 up to 3600, which was given the name sar. This number could then be multiplied again up to 216,000, which was given the name Sargal, which translates literally as Big Sar. Finally, Sargal could be multiplied again up to 12,960,000, represented by the phrase Sargal Sunu Targ, literally meaning unit greater than Big Sar, or Big Sar that the hand cannot reach. It's important to note, however, that the context of Sargal Sunu Targ in its original source is debated, and it could just mean a sort of repetition of Sargal, which would make Sargal the largest unit given a phrase at the time. These oral numbers gained written forms, known as the Archaic Numbers, around 3200 BC, which gave new symbols to 1, 10, 60, 600, 3600, and 36,000. The 3600 symbol would also typically be combined with the 60 symbol to represent 216,000. A clay tablet dating to around 2650 BC contains some of these symbols, as well as the cuneiform 
on text Seeger, a unit of volume representing 1,152,000 Sela, another common unit of volume at the time. The Seeger is intended to represent a granary of barley, which is about 970,000 litres today. And the purpose of the tablet is to divide the number evenly in 7 to give 164,571 with an extra 3 sealer left over, a remarkable feat to calculate for the time. The original archaic symbols were rotated around 2700 BC and then slowly converted into the cuneiform numbers a few hundred years after that. The cuneiform numbers introduced a new set of symbols with a brand new symbol for 216,000. A tablet using this cuneiform, dating to between 1500 and 1800 BC, includes a representation of the number 18,144,220, making it the largest known written number at the time. Is this too boring? I can put subway surfers in the corner if it helps you focus. From around 2000 BC up to 1500 BC, the base 60 sexagesimal system was gradually supplemented with a base 10 decimal system. For example, a writing from 714 BC includes the number 305,412 using a base 10 notation. The Assyro Babylonian numeral system had symbols for up to a thousand, and you could combine two symbols for numbers up to a million. However, despite both base 10 and base 60 systems being in place, most of the large numbers known from Babylon were in base 60. For example, an astronomical tablet from the ancient city of Uruk around 300 BC, also one of the first ever uses of the number zero, makes mention of the number 26,012,284 using base 60. Meanwhile, in other parts of the world, the other civilizations were devising their own numeral systems. <laughs> Although Egypt and Mesopotamia were known to keep in contact, the ancient Egyptian counting system takes no influence from the way the Sumerians counted. The ancient Egyptian numerals, written in hieroglyphics, used base 10 and had symbols for 1, 10, 100, 1000, 10,000, 100,000, and a million. The existence of a million in the form of a symbol of a man on his knees implies that it was of a more religious purpose. It's believed to represent a man holding up the vault of heaven, however it still had some use cases. The inscription on the handle of the club of King Namur, dating to between 2900 and 3000 BC, includes the number 1,422,000, which, since it predates the cuneiform tablet by around 1300 years, was the largest written number at this time. Some sources also claim the existence of a sun hieroglyph representing 10 million at some later point, but this claim is dubious as the symbol is known to be used to represent infinity and could have been mistaken for the next power of 10. Meanwhile, over in Europe, the Attic numeral system, adopted by the ancient Greeks around 700 BC, has symbols for numbers up to 50,000. This system later evolved into the Etruscan numerals, which then became the basis for two separate very well-known numeral systems, the Greek numerals and the Roman numerals. <laughs> By around 500 BC, the Romans had developed their own set of symbols for 1 through 1000. These symbols developed incrementally over time, first from the Etruscan numerals, then to the archaic Roman numerals, and then to the modern system we know today over the next few hundred years. The rules for constructing Roman numerals were also originally different from the modern Roman numeral system. For units like 4 and 40, they would simply add 4 of the same symbol together, instead of the system we know today where 4 is denoted as IV, or 1 by Four, five. Thus, the largest number that could be constructed using the symbols at the time was 4,999, unless you wanted to use a long string of M's to denote a larger number. Starting from around 300 BC, a few different notations were conceived for symbols representing larger numbers, one of which was a series of rings or marks around a central character, known as the apostrophus method. This system made sense as an extension for the symbol for a thousand, which at the time typically looked like this. The usage of M for a thousand was actually rare until the medieval period. This notation took on many different forms over the course of various time periods leading up to the Middle Ages, though they all shared commonalities, one of which being that the symbols usually went up to a hundred thousand. The ancient Romans seemed to have not taken the system any further. They would instead say something like Decius Centena Malia, or ten hundred thousand, to represent a million. One of these forms, which uses forward and backward C's around an I, is still sometimes used to this day. The other main method the Romans used for achieving large numbers was the vinculum. 
Why, just look at those peculiar markings. Ah! Following the now widespread principle of multiplication, the Romans would sometimes use a horizontal bar or vinculum over a number to denote a multiple of a thousand. These overline numbers could then be combined with smaller numbers to denote any number well into the hundreds of thousands. Shortly after the introduction of the vinculum, the Romans quickly realised that they would sometimes need to denote even larger numbers, and thus the notation was extended to include vertical bars on either side of a number to denote a multiple of a hundred thousand. It is claimed that the largest number expressed during this time was 35,863,120, although there is apparently an inscription from 103 AD that includes two infinity symbols at the time used to represent a thousand with the three line box over them, making it equal to 200 million, but I wasn't able to find any corroborating evidence for this. Numbers of the scale were only used in rare circumstances, but the system technically allowed for the denotation of numbers up to 499,999,999. The logical continuation of the system is of course to add two overlines over a character to denote a multiple of a million, allowing for numbers up to 4,999,999,999. Though this idea was likely invented by modern authors and not used by the Romans. You could, of course, take it even further if you wanted to, adding as many overlines as you can fit on your paper or text document. This system causes some confusion, however, as the Emperor Tiberius would encounter in 14 AD. On succeeding to his mother Livia, Emperor Tiberius had to pay large sums of money to her legatees. Tiberius' mother had written the amount of her legacy to young Galba in this form, but Galba had not taken the precaution of checking that the amount was written out in words. So, when he presented himself to Tiberius, Galba thought that the five seas had been enclosed in vertical lines, and that therefore the sum due to him was fifty million sesterces. But Tiberius took advantage of the fact that the two sidebars were very short, and claimed that this representation was a simple line above the five C's. My mother should have written them this way if you were to be right, he said, since the simple line only represented multiplication by one thousand, Galba only received from Tiberius the sum of five hundred thousand sesterces which goes to show that an unstable notation system can turn a large fortune into a mere pittance. Suffice it to say that Galba got pwned. <laughs> Similar to how the symbols for Roman numerals shifted gradually over time, the Greek alphabet has had a long and complicated history intertwined with related alphabets like the Hebrew alphabet. Around 300 BC, the letters of the ancient Greek alphabet began to be used for a base 10 numeral system, with alpha for 1 all the way up to the now disused sampi for 900. Since the words and numbers used the same letters, numbers were distinguished with a small stroke similar to today's diacritics. Numbers from 1000 to 9000 used a different sign for the first 9 letters, and 10,000, known as the myriad, used the letter M with an alpha above it. This way, similar to the Roman vinculum, numbers would become multiples of 10,000 when placed above an M, allowing for numbers as large as 99,990,000 to be represented using a single combined symbol. Later, at around 200 BC, a new system was created for representing large numbers. Numbers were divided into classes based on powers of the myriad. The first class, called the elementary class, contained all the numbers up to 9999, that is to say all numbers less than the myriad. The second class, called the class of primary myriads, contained the multiples of the myriad by all numbers up to 9999, so the numbers 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, and so on up to 99,990,000. The third class was the secondary myriads, which contained the multiples of a myriad myriads, so the numbers 100 million, 200 million, 300 million, and so on up to 999 billion, 900 million. Then came the tertiary myriads, also known as the gamma myriads, then the delta myriads, then the epsilon myriads, and so on. Pappus of Alexandria, around 320 AD, gave the example of the number 5 quadrillion 462 trillion 360 
60 billion 64 million expressed as 5,462 tertiary myriads, 3,600 secondary myriads, and 6,400 primary myriads. Theoretically, up to 27 powers in the myriad were possible, allowing for numbers as high as 10 to the power of 112, or 1 followed by 112 zeros, although it seems numbers this large were never used in practice. You've got mail! Oh, we've got mail. It's a letter from Archimedes, the Greek mathematician. He has something he's been working on that he wants to show us. Archimedes, the guy who shouted Eureka that one time, was also pretty good at mathematics. Sometime around 250 BC, he wrote The Sand Reckoner, in which he attempted to determine an upper bound for the number of grains of sand that could fit in the observable universe. He calculated it to be around 10 to the power of 63, although this is nowhere near the largest number Archimedes defined in this work. Following the earlier myriad system, Archimedes created a series of orders based on powers of 100 million or a myriad squared. Numbers up to 100 million, or 10 to the power of 8, were part of the first order, numbers up to 10 to the power of 16 were part of the second order, and so on and so on, all the way up to the 100 millionth order, giving us a value of 10 to the power of 8 to the power of 10 to the power of 8, which is equal to 10 to the power of 800 million. These orders were called the orders of the first period. He then constructed the orders of the second period by taking multiples of the last largest value to give us even larger numbers, and then again for the third period, and so on and so on until he had reached the hundred millionth period. The largest number named by Archimedes was the last number in this period, a staggeringly large number equal to 10 to the power of 8 to the power of 10 to the power of 8 to the power of 10 to the power of 8 or a 1 followed by 80 quadrillion zeros. The Sand Reckoner marks a distinct change in the history of large numbers. No longer were numbers only being created and used for practical purposes like counting grain and cattle as they had been for in the past, and they weren't just created to represent the grandiosity of the gods or heavens either. And although Archimedes was somewhat in need of a numeral system to notate his sand calculation, he had no practical reason to extend the system as far as he did. No number beyond the first period would ever need to be used for any practical purposes, so his whole definition of periods served no practical purpose either. I believe Archimedes defined his extended system for the same reason that we play around with impractically large numbers today. Because large numbers intrigue us. They always have. We define them not because we need to, but because we want to. India has had a rich and extensive mathematical history, largely unknown by Western cultures. Although there isn't a huge amount of information known to us about ancient Indian mathematics, it seems they were well ahead of the Romans and Greeks in the field of large numbers. The Yajur Veda, dating to between 900 and 1200 BC, lists powers of 10 up to a trillion, known as a Pararata. A few centuries later, the Shankyayana Shata Sutra mentions powers of 10 up to 10 trillion, and the contemporary Taittiriya Samhita extends the list up to 10 quintillion. These two numbers likely set the record for the largest defined numbers at the time, but another source around 500 BC may have also described some extremely large numbers. The Buddha, a man with many birth dates but who probably lived around the 5th or 6th century AD, is claimed to have defined a kalpa as the following length of time. Imagine a huge empty cube at the beginning of a kalpa, approximately 16 miles on each side. Once every hundred years, you insert a tiny mustard seed into the cube. According to the Buddha, the huge cube will be filled even before the kalpa ends. Based on some educated guesses, this comes out at around 2.4 septillion years. However, this description may have been misattributed to him. A similar description was mentioned in the Prajna Paramita Sutras much later, between 150 and 250 AD. The Kalpa is also defined more rigorously as 4.32 billion years, but it's hard to determine even when this figure was first defined. The Lalita Vistara Sutra includes a section about the Buddha explaining a number system to the mathematician Arjuna, in which multiple large numbers are listed, the largest of which is an Uttara Parama Anuraja Pravesha commonly accepted to be equal to 10 to the power of 421. However, there is another interpretation of the text. The Big Psi Project, a large number encyclopedia created by weird people, performed their own calculation and came to a value of 10 to the power of 464. Unfortunately, however, this takes place around 150 years after the Sand Reckoner, and is thus not a large number record.
The Buddhavatamsaka Sutra, also known as the Avatamsaka Sutra, or the Flower Garland Sutra, is a combination of East Asian Buddhist scriptures that are largely religious in nature. Created sometime around the 3rd or 4th century AD, the sutra uses recursive description to define a number known as the Asamkhyaya, equal to 10 to the power of 5 times 2 to the power of 104, a frankly enormous number. Okay wait, I've got a different source that says 10 to the power of 5 times 2 to the power of 103, or 10 to the power of 7 times 2 to the power of 103? What is going on? Okay, it seems we need to break this down a bit more. The creation of the Avatamsaka Sutra supposedly began around 500 years after the death of the Buddha, or around the 1st century AD. It is a series of scriptures likely written by different people and combined around the 3rd or 4th century AD, as mentioned earlier. Around 420 AD, the Indian translator Buddhabhadra translated the text from its original Sanskrit into Chinese, and later, around 700 AD, a different translator by the name of Shikshananda created a different Chinese translation, and in around 800 AD, a translator by the name of Prajna translated part of the text into Chinese again, making three total Chinese translations. Then in the late 9th century AD, the Buddhist monk Jinamitra translated it into Tibetan, and much later in 1993, Thomas Clary translated Shikshananda's translation into English. That gives us the original Sanskrit version, which likely continued gaining sections up to the 9th century, three Chinese translations, a Tibetan translation, and an English translation, which makes six different major versions of the sutra in total on top of the other 30 or so minor versions. I'm going insane! <sighs> okay, so. The 420 AD translation by Buddhabhadra defines an Asamkhyaya is equal to 10 to the power of 5 times 2 to the power of 103. The 700 AD translation by Shikshananda defines it as equal to 10 to the power of 7 times 2 to the power of 103. And Thomas Clary's 1993 translation contains a few errors but defines it roughly as 10 to the power of 5 times 2 to the power of 104. The commonly accepted value in English communities is Thomas Clary's, but in Japan Japan, it's believed that Shikshananda's is more accurate. The enormous scale of the Asamkhyaya is achieved through a method that involves the repeated squaring of smaller numbers, some of which are also given their own names. This is a common theme in the Avatamsaka Sutra. Large sections of the text are just repetitively listing names over and over again. Seriously, reading the sutra makes me feel like I'm going insane. Look, I'll get an AI to quote a section for you. How do great enlightening beings enter into and emerge from this concentration? They enter this concentration internally and emerge externally. Entering externally, they emerge internally. Entering in the same body, they emerge in a different body. Entering in a different body, they emerge in the same body. Entering in a human body, they emerge in a yaksha body. Entering in a yaksha body, they emerge in a human body. Entering in a dragon body, they emerge in a titan body. Entering in a titan body, they emerge in a celestial body. Entering in a celestial body, they emerge in a Brahma king body. Entering in a- And so on and so on and so on, you get the idea. This goes on for an entire page and a half, but it gives you an idea of how the ancient Indians perceived the concepts of God and infinity. It's very different to how Western texts describe the Christian God. Indeed, the main point of these large numbers was to scrape infinity, in a way similar to how we see our largest defined numbers today. More on that later. And would you be surprised to learn that the Asamkhyaya is not the largest number described in the sutra? It continues past the incalculable by repeatedly taking the fourth power of the last number, and Thomas Clary translates the names as follows. Measureless, boundless, incomparable, innumerable, unaccountable, unthinkable, immeasurable, unspeakable, untold, and finally a square untold which under his translation is equal to 10 to the power of 5 times 2 to the power of 124. Shikshananda's version gives a value of 10 to the power of 7 times 2 to the power of 122, and Prajna's 800 AD translation takes it much further, coming to a final value of 10 to the power of 7 times 2 to the power of 142. The translated version of the sutra then goes on to say, If untold Buddha lands are reduced to atoms, in one atom are untold lands, and as in one, so in each. The atoms to which these Buddha lands are reduced in an instant are unspeakable, and so are the atoms of continuous reduction moment to moment, going on for untold eons. These atoms contain lands unspeakably many, and the atoms in these lands are even harder to tell of. Counting this way for unspeakable eons, 
using unspeakable numbers, counting eons by these atoms, one atom standing for ten myriad unspeakable numbers of eons. If you praise a single universally good for that many eons, it would still be impossible to exhaust the amount of virtue of universal good. This can be interpreted as multiplying and untold by itself for every moment in an unspeakable number of eons, each of which we can assume to be an untold number of moments. If we interpret it this way, the final number described is equal to 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 37. That is insane! But that's not all. Big Sai examines a specific interpretation of the text to define an even larger number. They start off by saying the following. It's a pity the mathematical theory of recursion was never in the purview of the translators. What makes the interpretation difficult is to establish the intended order of reasoning, which is to begin with in Sanskrit poetry often the other way around, and then obscured by Chinese grammar which is all too flexible. They went on to interpret a section of Clary's translation as a Tower of Powers, also known as Tetration. Tetration wasn't supposed to come up in the script until much later since it wasn't even properly defined until modern times, but in short, 10 tetrated to 2 is 10 to the 10, 10 tetrated to 3 is 10 to the 10 to the 10, 10 tetrated to 4 is 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 10, and so on. I think you see the pattern and why it's called a power tower. This series grows much much faster than the squaring method seen previously, so much so that numbers using it can only be expressed in terms of tetration. So how large is the tetration number that Big Psy came up with? The new ancient world record number is defined exactly and traditionally as the great Indian unspeakable tetration 10 tetrated to 10 to the power of 5 times 2 to the power of 120 of the Avatamsaka Sutra thus far unknown in the history of mathematics. That is astoundingly large, it's mind-blowing. Unfortunately, since it derives from a specific interpretation of Clary's English translation, it's debatable whether it counts as a large number record. But they're right, when they wrote this in 2011, such an interpretation was completely new. But they're not the only ones who discovered something big. Right when I thought I was done with Indian mathematics, I ended up finding something and getting sucked right back in. <sighs> Jainism is an Indian religion that has existed at least since the 2nd millennium BC, but only really got started around the time of the Buddha in the 4th and 5th centuries BC. And the main thing you need to know about the Jains is that they were fucking crazy about large numbers. For example, they claimed that our time cycle has seen 24 Tirthankaras, the first of which, Rishabhanatha, is claimed to have been born 10 to the power of 224 years ago and lived for 592 quintillion years. It's unclear it's unclear when these numbers were first given, but one possible source is the Acharanga Sutra written around the 4th or 5th century BC, making it possibly a large number record for the time. The Surya Prajnapti is an ancient text from around the 4th century BC that separates the mathematical numbers into three groups, Samkhyata or numerable, Asamkhyata or innumerable, and Ananta or infinite. The Asamkhyata is similar to the Asamkhyaya, the so-called incalculable number that was mentioned in the Avatamsaka Sutra as well as various other ancient Indian texts. The Asamkhyata and the Asamkhyaya are typically stand-ins for any incomprehensibly large non-infinite number, something the Jains cared a great deal about. Since the Asamkhyaya generally stands in for any large number, various texts have assigned wildly different values to it, of which the Avatamsaka Sutra definition is the largest. The Surya Prajnapti splits the three types of numbers further. The numerable numbers are split into three categories. The innumerable numbers are also split into three categories, each with their own three subcategories, making nine in total. And the infinite numbers are also split into nine subcategories. The phrases Padita and Yukta are vague and don't translate literally, so English speakers have to guess their implied meaning here. You may be wondering why incalculably large or infinite numbers would be split into categories ordered seemingly by size, and the reason is that the Jains, who use large numbers very often, quickly realized that repeating phrases and names over and over, defining long lists of powers of 10, gets cumbersome fast. So the innumerable and infinite numbers are designed as stand-ins. The Jains also thought about infinity and the inaccessible in different ways than we do today. Innumerable numbers were seen as numbers so large that we can't 
can't even properly grasp them, they are beyond practicality. Likewise, infinite numbers were seen as numbers so large that they didn't even physically exist, even in the so-called boundless universe the Jains imagined. These numbers aren't just impractical, they are virtual and that they don't exist in this universe. However, like the so-called incalculable Asamkiyaya, various values and formulas have been assigned to these numbers by Jain texts, making them very exciting from a large number point of view. Let's start with the definitions of the numerable numbers. JS is defined specifically as 2. It is claimed that the number 1 is not counted as a numerable number, because a numerable number is an integer which increases by squaring, but the square of 1 is only 1. Hence the numerable numbers start with 2. I know it's weird. MS is defined as any numerable number larger than 2 and smaller than US, and US is equal to JPA minus 1. So what definition do the Jains give for JPA? Well there are two based on which tradition you pick, and both are very wordy and confusing. But I was stunned to discover that both definitions give a final value of around 10 tetrated to 10 to the power of 136, or a power tower of 10 is 10 to the power of 136 tall. This blows everything, bar the controversial unspeakable tetration, out of the water. And what's weird is I haven't seen this mentioned anywhere in large number communities like the Avatamsaka Sutra is. The sources appear credible, but nowhere outside of a few mentions from Indian scholars and old books is it talked about. Well, until I wrote an article about it. So when was this number first defined? The most likely source is the Anuyoga Dwara Sutra, created sometime between 200 BC and 100 AD, probably closer to the latter. This means it predates the Avatamsaka Sutra, it well predates the English translation the unspeakable Tetration came from, and takes its rightful crown as the largest number of the ancient world, or it would if there wasn't a whole series of numbers larger than it. Let's take a look at them. MPA is equal to any number larger than JPA and smaller than UPA. UPA is equal to JYA minus 1. JYA is simply equal to JPA raised to the power of itself. MYA and UYA are equivalent to MPA and UPA. I think you're starting to see a pattern here. JAA is again equal to JYA raised to the power of itself. MAA is any number larger than JAA and smaller than UAA, but UAA is a bit more complicated. It has four definitions, of which the two larger ones define the operation Vargita Samvargita as raising a number to the power of itself, an early form of tetration. The smaller of the two definitions is roughly equal to this operation performed on JAA nine times, roughly equivalent to JAA tetrated to the tenth. The larger definition is even more insane. It defines the operation Shalaka Trayanishtapana as approximately x tetrated to x tetrated to x tetrated to x, and the final definition is equal to that operation performed on JAA three times in a row. Since JAA is basically the same size as JPA, this makes UAA roughly equal to JPA tetrated to JPA tetrated to JPA, and so on and so on nine times in total, or a around 10 pentated to the 11th. Tetration is such an immense operation that it's practically unfathomable, not to mention pentation. It, it makes me wish I could have put the tetration section before this one, since numbers this large weren't even supposed to come up at this point chronologically. It's insane, but would you believe we still aren't done? Indian mathematics is the gift that keeps on giving. The infinities act largely the same way as the innumerables. JPN is equal to UAA plus 1, JYN is equal to JPN raised to the power of itself, and JNN is equal to JYN raised to the power of itself again. This is where it gets interesting. According to the Shvetambara tradition, UNN does not exist. There is no ultimate final number. However, according to the Digambara tradition, there are three definitions for it. The first is equal to JNN to the power of 64, the second is roughly equal to JNN tetrated to the 27th, and the largest value is approximately equal to JNN pentated to the 28th, giving a final number of around 10 pentated to the 38th. This is the peak of Jain numbers, it was created with the intention of there never being anything larger and I think they did pretty well. 
Ancient Indian history raises many problems. The period before the Christian era takes on a haziness that seems to have prompted opposing reactions. There are those who make excessive claims for the antiquity of Indian mathematics, and others who go to the opposite extreme and deny the existence of any real Indian mathematics before about AD 500. The principal motive of the former is to emphasize the uniqueness of Indian mathematical achievements. In this view, if there was any influence, it was always a one-way traffic from India to the rest of the world. The motives of the latter are more mixed. For some, their Eurocentrism, or Greco-centrism, is so deeply entrenched that they cannot bring themselves to face the idea of independent developments in early Indian mathematics, even as a remote possibility. There's no doubt that a lot of the important aspects of mathematics were originally devised by the Indians and other Asian cultures, and that a lot of it is either unknown or intentionally swept away in favour of more Eurocentric views, frustrating as it is. Translating and interpreting ancient Indian texts is still an open task, and it's likely that doing so will reveal more and more information to the world about the history of mathematics. So even if researching large numbers in the Eastern world took way longer than I expected it to, and the sections on Indian numbers ballooned to like 3,000 words, I'm happy I found this information. So what was the first ever large number used by humans? It depends how you define it. It could be the 29-notch Labombo bone, or it could be Sargal Sunu Targ, or the largest symbol from the first ever numeral system, representing 36,000. Or if your standards for large numbers are high enough, you might consider the Sand Reckoner the first real exploration of them. The main thing I learned from researching this section is that even in the cases where history is well studied and fully written about, it's still often really confusing and muddy. The development of the Roman and Greek numerals were not sharp changes but a slow progression, with different symbols developing differently over time, and that's not even mentioning the confusing timeline of ancient India. And there are a lot of different ways that you could define the existence of a large number. If a number is given a name but never used in practice, does it count? Sargal Sunu Targ seems to have never been used in practice, and it may not have even meant what we think it does. And a lot of systems, like the hugely extendable Greek myriad system, allow for the existence of large numbers, even if those numbers were never used or written down in ancient times. And of course, a lot of ancient scrolls and tablets casually mention large numbers for unimportant things or for hyperbole, so it's quite hard to produce a proper list of what numbers were mentioned when. For stuff like this, I think it's best to leave it to you to come up with your own personal list of what counts. This section ended up being way longer than I expected, mainly due to all the Jane stuff. A lot of the crucial information for this came from the Universal History of Numbers, which has also been the source for a lot of the infographics. It's been super helpful all around. I also want to thank Fish, a fellow large number enthusiast. He helped a lot with the ancient Indian stuff, and he probably knows more about the Asamkiyaya than anyone else on the planet. Also, I've been super self-conscious about my voice while recording this. I feel like I'm doing a little bit better than the start of the video, but it still kind of sucks. I hope it's not bringing down the quality too much, but what can you do? That was supposed to be the point where I switched to a new microphone, but it ended up being worse than my headset, so... The nucleus of a uranium-235 atom... But with space being really big and all, the chances of being picked up within that time are 2 to the power of 2,079,460,347 to 1 against. What's up? I hope you used that break to go get a drink. Looking back at the first section, I wish I put a few more jokes in, but unfortunately I won't be able to slip content in until someone teaches me how to properly use DaVinci Resolve, I'm so sorry. The section's a bit shorter and uh, more assorted, so let's start off with something fun. In a story first recorded in 1256, the supposed inventor of chess, thought to be the Indian Sisa ibn Dahir, shared the game with the country's ruler, who was so pleased with the brilliance of the game that he let the man name any request he liked. The man's request was simple, that one grain of wheat be placed on the first square of the chessboard, 
2 on the 2nd, 4 on the 3rd, 8 on the 4th, 16 on the 5th, and so on. The happy ruler immediately obliged, bringing in buckets of wheat from the local granary. However, by the time the 26th square had been reached, the entire room was full to the brim with wheat, and the ruler's court treasurers reported that fulfilling the request would be impossible. Versions of the story differ as to whether the inventor became a high-ranking advisor or was executed. The fulfillment of the inventor's request would have required the procurement of 18 quintillion grains of wheat, which I calculated to be considerably more than could be produced by an Indian wheat farm. In fact, that amount of wheat laid end to end would be over 15 light years long, enough to reach all the way to Alpha Centauri, the closest star to our sun, four times over. Now our only hope is for a new form of chess to be invented so that our leaders can solve world hunger instead of sending all the rice to Alpha Centauri. Depending on how you define it, Pi is either not very large or absolutely enormous. Although the reason for the universe choosing to make the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter completely impossible to fully calculate is only for the gods to know, the endless irrationality of Pi has spawned a long history of attempts to approximate it. The ancient Egyptians, Babylonians, and Sumerians all had different approximations for Pi by around 2000 BC. The Egyptians used 4 times 8 ninths squared, the Babylonians used 3 plus an eighth, and the Sumerians used 3 plus 23 216ths. Despite having the simplest formula, the Babylonians were surprisingly the closest to the actual figure, being just 0.0166 off. Much later, around 250 BC, Archimedes set an upper and lower bound for pi, both correct to two decimal places. And around 400 years after him, Ptolemy found the fraction 377 over 120, a figure correct to three decimal places. Around 480 AD, Chinese mathematician Zhu Chongzhi found the fraction 355 over 113, a fraction with an astounding six correct decimal places. He also gave a lower bound for pi at 3.1415926, a figure correct to seven decimal places. In the 1400s, Indian mathematician Madhava of Sangamagrama discovered pi as the product of an infinite series, now known as the Madhava Leibniz series, and gave a value correct to 10 decimal places. Around the same time, Persian astronomer Jamshid al Kashi crafted a polygon with 800 million sides, giving a figure correct to 16 decimal places. Similar to a boring mathematical industrial revolution, after the 16th century the rate of progress quickly increased rapidly. Dutch mathematician Ludolf van Coelen gave a figure correct to 20 digits and in later one correct to 32. Dutch scientist Willebrod Snellius, is that actually his fucking name, reached 34 digits in 1621, and Austrian astronomer Christoph Grienberger reached 38 digits in 1630 by crafting a shape with 10 to the power of 40 sides. I I genuinely have no idea how that's possible. Later, in 1706, John Maschin was the first to reach a hundred digits by devising a new formula. The record continued to increase many more times over the next few hundred years, culminating in a record of 620 digits in 1946, the last record that would ever be set by hand. A few records were calculated using a desk calculator. 710 digits in January 1947, 808 digits in September 1947, and finally 1120 digits in 1949. Later that year, the ENIAC computer was used to calculate 2037 digits over the course of three days, the first record set with an electronic computer. Six more records were set over the course of the 1950s, and by 1961 Pi had been calculated to over 100,000 digits, a process that took just nine hours. By 1973, one million digits had been reached using a CDC 7600 supercomputer. The record then passed 10 million digits in 1983, 100 million digits just four years later in 1987, and a billion digits just two years after that in August 1989. In 2002, the Department of Information Science at the University of Tokyo calculated 1.24 trillion digits, a process that took 600 hours. I am well aware that we have passed the end of early modern history by this point. I promise we'll get back into the older stuff after this. Intriguingly, after 2009, the record would stop being set by supercomputers and begin being set by home computers and servers using commercially available parts. That's right, you too can set a world record. All you need 
need is $10,000 in about half a year. In 2010, Shigeru Kondo calculated Pi to 5 trillion digits using his own desktop, a process that took 90 days. He immediately began calculating Pi to 10 trillion digits, a feat which took 371 days. A couple of years later, using improved software and some better computer parts, he achieved 12 trillion digits. The record traded places multiple times over the next decade, hitting 13, 22, 31, 50, 62, and finally 100 trillion digits in 2022. The 100 trillion digit record was set by Emma Haruka Iwao using Google Cloud, a process that took 158 days. Nine months later in April of this year, the group Storage Review matched the 100 trillion record in just 59 days using their own server. Suck it, Google! Thanks to these brave souls, we now know that the 100 trillionth digit of pi is zero, an incredibly useful and practical fact. There is no doubt that the record will continue to be beaten, and we'll probably see a new record within the next couple of years at our current rate of progress. It'll be interesting to see just how far the record can be taken, and hopefully someday we'll find the final digit of pi just to prove all those stupid mathematicians wrong. The year is 1920. Walking along the bank of the Hudson River, mathematician Edward Kasner is searching for a new name to describe a very large number, a one followed by a hundred zeros. He asks his nephew Milton, nine years old at the time, for a name. The kid gives two names, Google and Googleplex. The original definition for a Googleplex was a one followed by writing zeros until you get tired, but Kasner decided to give it a more formal definition. A one followed by a Google zeros. This gives the two numbers values of 10 to the power of 100 and 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 100, respectively. The Google is notable for three reasons. First, you might have guessed, it's the source of the name Google, meant to imply that the search engine can provide enormous quantities of information. Second, in September 2001, Okay, this isn't going where you think it is, I promise. In September 2001, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire hosted British Army Major Charles Ingram, who in a spectacular show won the million dollar prize just two days after another contestant had also won. The very last million dollar question Ingram received was A number one, followed by 100 zeros, is known by what name? And after nearly five minutes of contemplation, he answered Google, winning the million pound prize. However, while reviewing the recording, the production staff realized that Ingram seemed to be choosing his answers in conjunction to the coughing of fellow contestant Tequin Wittick. After a two-year investigation, in April 2003, both Ingram and Wittick were found guilty in court and given suspended prison sentences and huge fines. The episode of the show wasn't released publicly for nearly two decades, and Ingram claims to this day that he's in a Innocent. The word Google is also notable for becoming the basis of Googleology, the study of large numbers. To all the people watching who already knew that, yes, I've been avoiding using that word until now. The people needed context, okay? We're going back in time again. This timeline is a mess, I know. Although the word million was first used around 1270, it didn't start to enter the English language until around the late 1300s. Specifically, one of the first notable uses was by William Langlard for a poem in 1360. Later, in 1475, French mathematician Jean Adam used the words bimillion and trimillion to represent 10 to the 12 and 10 to the 18 respectively, making a bimillion equal to a million squared and a trimillion equal to a million cubed. A decade after that, Nicolas Chouke used the words billion, trillion, quadrillion, quillion, sixtillion, septillion, ottillion, and nonillion to refer to powers of a million up to 10 to the 54th. In 1516, Guillaume Boudet created the term milliard to refer to 10 to the 9th, which later became the word milliard. This formed the basis of the so-called long scale, where million, billion, trillion, and so on represented powers of a million, and milliard, billiard, trillion and so on represented the Ilians multiplied by a thousand. However, in the late 1700s the short scale was devised, where a billion was a thousand million and a trillion was a thousand billion. This short scale gradually increased in popularity into the 19th century, and it might be the scale you're familiar with. To this day, some countries use the short scale of standard, and some use the long scale, becoming one of the many standards where things are way more confusing than they need to be. In the US and UK, the short scale is standard, but in mainland Europe, the long scale is standard. And in 
Russia and the Middle East they use the short scale but with milliard instead of billion, and in Asia they use an entirely different system because sure, why not? According to Merriam-Webster, the modern words quadrillion, quintillion, sextillion, septillion, octillion, and nonillion were first used around 1690. These can be thought of as the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th illions respectively. The 10th illion named decillion, equal to 10 to the 33 in the short scale, was first used in 1844, with illions up to 20 appearing over the next decade. The 100th illion is known as a centillion, equal to 10 to the power of 303, which was also named in the 1850s. And that's it. That is every illion ever defined. There were a few attempts across the 1800s to fill out the aliens between 20 and 100, as well as to extend the system further. The most complete of these attempts was by one Professor Henkel in 1860, who devised a modular system to name any number up to the 999th alien. He also gave the name Millillion to the thousandth alien, and Millimillion to the millionth alien, which since he was using the long scale was equal to 10 to the power of 6 million. These names would end up sticking through to today, with Rudolf von Draeger extending the list up to the very unwieldy Miller Miller Millillion. A more consistent naming scheme was devised in 1996 by John Conway of Game of Life fame, and his name of Miller Nilla Nillion would thankfully grow to more commonly be called a Microlion, thanks to a famed man in the large number community, Jonathan Bowers. University of Texas. Bowers created a whole list of his own alien numbers in the early 2000s on this webpage that looks like it's from the early 2000s, and the largest of these numbers, the Maltillion, is equal to a staggering 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 42. He does this by considering the alien number of a number, where a million is the first alien, a billion is the second, and so on, and instead making that increase like the aliens to define a whole new set or regiment of aliens that increases way faster. Faster. This process can be repeated to make endless regiments of aliens like a power tower, although Bowers clearly showed restraint by stopping at the fourth. But he wasn't the first person to have this idea. Back in 1983, another less known author by the name of John Candelaria recursed on this idea by asking what would the Millillionth Regiment be? His answer was a millimillion alien, Jesus Christ, which is approximately equal to 10 tetrated to a millillion. Impressive. Many, many, many other people have since come up with their own lists of alien names, and I can't blame them, it's, it's really fun. Feel free to come up with your own aliens if the idea interests you. Bad news for the middle school community, gazillion and gajillion are not real numbers. Fooled you, they actually are. Reality is a lie, everything is a number. <laughs> Modern arithmetic makes use of three main operators, addition, multiplication, and exponentiation, or powers. Here's one way to look at them. Addition can be thought of as repeatedly incrementing a number by one. A plus B is the same as adding one to A B times. Likewise, multiplication can be thought of as repeated addition, where A times B is the same as A added to itself B times. And exponentiation can be thought of as repeated multiplication, where A to the power of B is equal to a multiplied by itself b times. As we've seen, exponentiation is a very powerful tool to create very large numbers very quickly, as well as a useful way to notate them. Seeing these three operations in order, you may be tempted to ask what repeated exponentiation would look like. As you've no doubt realized by now, this operation has a name, and the name is tetration. But before we take a look at the history, we need to talk about a quirk of exponentiation. Unlike multiplication, exponentiation is not commutative, meaning that x to the power of y doesn't necessarily equal y to the power of x. Also, more importantly, exponentiation is not associative, meaning that x to the y to the power of z doesn't always equal x to the power of y to the power of z. For example, 2 to the 3 to the power of 4 equals 4096, whereas 2 to the power of 3 to the 4 equals 2.4 septillion, much much larger. This means that there are two ways to calculate a tower of powers, bottom up or left associative and top down or right associative. 
The commonly accepted method is top-down, since it's both more practical and produces much larger numbers. So if you're calculating tetration, you always work top-down. For example, 10 to the 10 to the 5 is equal to 10 to the power of 100,000, or a 1 followed by 100,000 zeros. Alright, enough math talk, who defines tetration? In 1901, Hans Mauder published Über die Funktion y ist gleich x hoch x hoch x vor Gonzalez Argument Abundansen, in which he names this operation abundance and gives a notation for it in the form of a number to the top left of another number. As you've no doubt realized, tetration grows incredibly fast. 2 tetrated to 3 is equal to 16, whereas 2 tetrated to 4 equals 2 to the power of 16, which is 65,536. 2 tetrated to 5 is equal to 2 to the power of 65,536, a number already far larger than the number of atoms you could fit in the observable universe. Although it is hard to read Mulder's paper since I can't read German and had to translate it to English, I did notice that it mentions a reference to an earlier book, Das Dasein Gottes und das Glück der Menschen, written by August Kronig in 1874. This book, in its chapter about the infinite, devises the function vx, which is defined the same way is x tetrated to x, and gives a visual description of v4 as follows. Imagine a straight line of such length that a beam of light which covers 42,000 miles in a second would need a quintillion, written as 1 in 30 zeros years to traverse it. Furthermore, consider a sphere described with this line as its radius and the volume of the sphere filled with printer ink. This latter quantity would not suffice to print the number V4 calculated according to the decimal system with the smallest existing legible letters. The book also briefly mentions V5, roughly equal to 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 2184, and Kronig has this to say about it. If the task were put to me to describe V5 in a similar manner, I truly wouldn't know how to begin. He also briefly mentions V1001, roughly equal to 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 10 with a thousand and one tens, which would possibly be the largest defined number at the time if it wasn't for the Jains. Oh yeah, we should talk about that. I originally wrote this section before I found out that the ancient Indians defined tetration and pentation like 2000 years ago, which good on them, but I'm going to keep the date for this section as 1874. Also, I had to translate German texts for y'all. To clarify, my German is awful, so I had to use GPT-4 for this with a little bit of manual polishing, so the translations may not be 100% accurate, but they get the point across. The translated sections can be found at this link if you're interested in reading them in full. The obvious next step after repeated exponentiation is repeated tetration, which is known as pentation. You may also remember that from the Jainism section. After pentation comes hexation, then heptation, and so on. The numbers that could be created using these operations are so unfathomably big it's impossible to even describe them. But it's clear that our process is still lacking, we need to generalize this operator repetition. Hyperoperators, alternatively hyperoperations, refer to any operation beyond the standard addition, multiplication, and exponentiation. An easy way to notate these is with Donald Knuth's up arrow notation, where exponentiation is represented with one up arrow, tetration using two up arrows, pentation using three, and so on and so on as high as you like. This has the bonus of easily being typable using the caret symbol on your keyboard, which you've probably realized is what I've been doing this whole time. In 1920, in 1928, Wilhelm Ackermann published a function denoted by the Greek letter phi, now and nowadays as the Ackermann function. It takes in three inputs, the last of which represents the operation to perform on the first two. AB0 is equivalent to A plus B, AB1 is equivalent to A times B, AB2 is equivalent to A to the power of B, and so on. As you can tell, this function grows equivalently to the hyperoperators, and it does so using just a simple set of rules. Later in 1950, Hugo Steinhaus defined a slightly different and more understandable alternative. His definition was simple. It is easy to write down very large numbers. So science can be defined very simply if we would write A inside a triangle, instead of A to the power of A. A inside a square, instead of A in A triangles, and A inside a circle, instead of A in A squares. Since A inside A triangles is a repetition of exponentiation, it grows at a similar rate to tetration. However, numbers defined using this method are slightly larger than numbers resulting from tetration. 
for example, a inside two triangles is not a to the a to the a, but instead a to the a to the power of a to the a. If we replace a with, say, 4, we find that 4 tetrated to the third is 4 to the power of 256, or around 10 to the power of 154, whereas 4 inside two triangles is 256 to the power of 256, or around 10 to the power of 616. Thus, a inside a square grows slightly faster than tetration, and a inside a circle grows slightly faster than pentation, although the notation is still mostly comparable with the hyperoperators. More interestingly is that it's defined in the exact same way as the ancient Indian method. The operation vs applied to a number x times is exactly the same as a number inside x triangles, and likewise the operation st is equal to a number inside 3 squares, or approximately x pentated to the fourth. Steinhaus also named two numbers of his own, mega defined as 2 inside a circle, and megaston defined as 10 inside a circle. Of course, you should know by now that the last thing large number enthusiasts like to do is stop there, for better or for worse, and thus Steinhaus's notation was extended by Leo Moser sometime in the 1960s. Moser's version replaces Steinhaus's circle with a pentagon, and then continues with hexagons, heptagons, etc., allowing for arbitrarily large operations just like the hyperoperators. It's unclear whether Moser himself defined it, but there exists a popular large number using this notation known as Moser's number, which is defined as 2 inside a megagon. This number has 10 tetrated to the 257 up arrows, but would you be surprised to learn that this is not the largest system defined at the time? You shouldn't be surprised, you should know better. You see those batteries over there? See how perfect they lay contained in their pretty little fucking package? My fucking god, man. Just begging to be swallowed like the precious little aesthetic tic tacs they are. How do you notate any number in base n using only n symbols? This is kind of an easy problem. So easy, in fact, it's already solved by the number notation we commonly use. In base 10, for example, the number 10 uses a 1 in the first column to denote 1 multiple of 10, plus a 0 in the second column to denote 0 multiples of 1. Likewise, 234 has 2 multiples of 100, 3 multiples of 10, and 4 multiples of 1. Very simple. We can also break it down in the following way. 234 is equal to 2 times 10 to the 2, plus 3 times 10 to the 1, plus 4 times 10 to the 0. Writing it this way has the bonus that we don't need to write any number larger than 10 here, and in fact, if we give 10 its own symbol, we can do away with the positional notation entirely, and notate any number using only addition, multiplication, and exponentiation. For example, if we had 8 in base 2, that'd be 2 to the power of 3, but we can't use 3, so we instead write it as 2 to the power of 2 plus 1. This is called hereditary base n notation, and although it's not a better system than positional base n, it does have an important use. In 1944, Reuben Goodstein defined an interesting sequence using this notation system. It works as follows. Start with any number you want, then write it in hereditary base 2 notation. Replace all the 2s in the number with 3s, and then subtract 1. As you can tell, this produces a much larger number. We then repeat the process. Make sure the number is in hereditary base 3, then replace the 3s with 4s and subtract 1, making the number larger again. The surprising thing about this sequence is that even though it starts by going up exponentially, it always eventually hits 0. Always. No matter how large your starting number is, it always goes up, slows down, starts decreasing, and then hits 0. That's crazy, right? But something even more crazy than that is just how large the numbers in these sequences get before hitting zero. If we define g n as the number of steps it takes the sequence starting with n to hit zero, g1, g2, and g3 give 2, 4, and 6 respectively, but g4 jumps to a wild 10 to the power of 121,210,694. g5 is equal to around 10 pentated to the fourth, G6 is around 10 heptated to the 6th, and by G8 we don't even have a good representation for it using hyperoperators. To comprehend the true scale of the Goodstein sequences, we're gonna need a new method. <laughs> 
the first two rules of the fast-growing hierarchy are defined as follows. f0 of n is n plus 1, and for any value of f larger than 0, f a plus 1 of n is equal to f a of f a of f a of f a and so on. For example, f1 of 4 is equal to 4 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, or 4 times 2. From these rules we can determine that f1 of n is equal to n times 2, f2 of n is roughly equal to 2 to the power of n, f3 of n is roughly equal to 2 tetrated to the n, and so on. This is functionally the same as the Moser method, except instead of starting with a to the power of a, it starts with a plus 1, which kind of makes more sense. What separates fgh from the hyperoperators, however, is a third rule that defines f omega of n, which is equal to f n of n, meaning that the operator of the function grows as n grows. We've just recursed over the hyperoperators. Now, the reason for using the Greek letter omega is a whole can of worms that I'm not gonna- listen, it's a whole thing okay? I'm not going to discuss ordinals. I can talk about the fast-growing hierarchy without explaining ordinals. I'm not going to talk about them, I'm not- Okay, on a serious note, although ordinals do play a huge part in modern Googleology and a basic understanding of them will be important, I don't think I could do an explanation justice. Which is why I'm recommending Vsauce's How to Count Past Infinity instead. If you haven't seen it, you should absolutely watch it. If you have, but you need a refresher, it's absolutely worth re-watching. Vsauce Michael does a better job explaining the basics than I ever could, so this is required watching. Go and watch it now and then come back. I'll be here. Welcome back. I hope Vsauce Michael's soothing voice provided a fitting intermission after having to deal with me for so long. Unless of course you already understand ordinals or you just didn't want to watch the video, in which case I'm so sorry. Okay, now we can get back on track. Let's take a closer look at the third rule of fgh. f a of n is equal to f a n of n if a is a limit ordinal. So what exactly does this mean? Specifically, a n refers to the nth term in the fundamental sequence of a. So what is a fundamental sequence? All ordinals are either a successor ordinal, meaning they come after another ordinal, or a limit ordinal, meaning they are the limit of a lower sequence and cannot be reached from below, like omega. That sequence that builds up to the limit ordinal is the fundamental sequence, and it's infinitely long. The fundamental sequence of omega is simple, it's just the integers. For omega times 2, the fundamental sequence will be omega, omega plus 1, omega plus 2, omega plus 3, etc. Since omega times 2 is the first first ordinal that sequence doesn't reach, or the supremum. Alright, let's put this into practice. It makes sense now why f omega of n is the same as f n of n, since n is the nth term in omega's fundamental sequence. So what would f omega plus 1 of n be? Well, rule 2 solves that. f omega plus 1 of n is equal to f omega of f omega of f omega of f omega, repeated n times. This makes an incredibly fast-growing function beyond even the scale of the hyperoperators. And we can continue further. f omega plus 2 of n is equal to f omega plus 1, repeated n times. f omega plus 3 is equal to f omega plus 2, repeated n times, and so on and so on. And we can recurse on this again using f omega times 2 of n, which is equal to f omega plus n of n. So, how far do we have to take these repetitions before we can reach the scale of the Goodstein sequences? Omega times 2 isn't nearly high enough to describe it, nor is omega times 3, or even omega times omega, which is omega squared. Not omega squared times 2, not omega cubed, not even omega to the power of omega. No, Goodstein sequences grow at a rate equal to f epsilon naught of n which is equivalent to omega to the omega to the omega to the omega to the omega, a recursion over an endless power tower of omegas. The sheer scale of a function that grows this large is completely impossible to imagine and incredibly hard to compare anything else to. There is nothing in our natural world that comes this close. Googleology has left the realm of layman understanding. It is now in the hands of the few who can look into the void and grasp it without going completely mad. Computers. Power level increases slightly, but remains well below the critical level. The operator starts the mechanism, which withdraws the course control rod. 
In the entry in which it talks about dying of asphyxiation 30 seconds after being thrown out of a spaceship, it goes on to say that what with space being the size it is, the chances of being picked up by another craft within those seconds are 2 to the power of 267,709 to 1 against. <laughs> Don't worry, Mega Man drops January 7th. Listen. I was never book smart, I'm money smart. Makes me more intelligent. Call me Mr. Rock Festival. I got hella bands. Shorty cute in her circle too. Told her get a friend. She gon' make me slide with my dog like I'm Mega Man. It's the 1970s, people are wearing bell bottoms and taking LSD or whatever, like I'd know. The fuck do people do in the 70s? They didn't have the internet, they didn't even have Tamagotchi. Anyway, around the same time work in the Googleology world was beginning to accelerate as a result of the recent advances in large functions. One of the most notable outputs of the time is in 1977, famed American juggler Ronald Graham devised an extraordinarily large number as the upper bound for the answer to a problem in Ramsey theory. Martin Gardner then wrote about the number in Scientific American, thus sharing it with the world, and he claimed it to be the largest number ever used in a serious mathematical proof. So how large is it? The definition for Graham's number uses a function called gn. g1 is equal to 3 hexated to the third. g2 is equal to a 3 followed by g1 up arrows followed by another 3. g3 is the same but with g2 up arrows and so on up until g64 which is Graham's number. This repeated recursion of up arrows is remarkably similar to the way that f omega plus 1 repeats a recursive process n times. And indeed Graham's number is roughly equal to f omega plus 1 of 64. Ronald Graham went on to become president of the International Jugglers Association, as well as becoming president of the American Mathematical Society, writing six books and over 400 papers. Unfortunately though, he passed away in 2020. Although Graham went on to do other works, and his number is far from the largest defined even at the time, it remains one of the most popular examples of an incomprehensibly large number to this day. In a 1962 paper, Hungarian mathematician Tibor Rado introduced an interesting computer-related game. The game is played on a Turing machine, a very basic form of computer composed of an endless string of tape and a head that can move back and forth and set each square of the tape to some symbol based on some instructions. Despite its simplicity, you might be surprised to learn that a Turing machine can perform any mathematical algorithm that a modern computer can. Multiplication, exponentiation, finding prime numbers, calculating pi. If you arrange the tape in a certain way, you could even get it to display frames like the pixels on a computer screen, although it would require a very complicated set of instructions. The Busy Beaver game typically uses a two-color Turing machine, or one where each square on the tape can only have one of two symbols, usually zero and one, and all squares start on zero. The typical version of the game, the one originally introduced in the paper, allows the machine to be in two different states, as well as an additional halting state where the machine stops running. Each of the two non-halting states is made up of three instructions, a symbol to set the tape under the head to, either a zero or a one, a direction to move the head either left or right, and which state to transition to for the next step, and the set of instructions to carry out is based on which symbol the tape under the head currently says. This means that each state has two options based on whether the current symbol is a zero or a one. The busy beaver function quantifies the maximum score, or squares in the one state, attainable by any busy beaver that eventually halts. Machines that run forever aren't counted, which means that every machine in this game must have at least one of its instructions include the halting state. For two states, this maximum score is 4, done by this busy beaver. This beaver starts on state A and runs as follows. If the state is state A and the head is on 0, print a 1, move right, and go to state B. If the state is state B and the head is on 0, print a 1, move left, and go to state A. If the state is state A and the head is on 1, print a 1, move left, and go to state B. And if the state is state B and the head is on 1, print a 1, move right, and finally halt. 
Another function can be defined as well, the maximum shifts function, defined as the maximum number of steps a busy beaver can undertake before halting. Remember, infinity is not allowed as an answer for this function or the busy beaver function, as it's trivial to make a busy beaver that runs forever. The busy beaver that wins the busy beaver game for two states is also the one that has the maximum shifts, it takes six steps to halt. For three states, there are five different machines that win the highest score, all ending on six ones. However, none of these machines run for the maximum number of steps. That belongs to a machine that ends with just five ones after 21 steps. The winners for four states are 13 ones and 107 steps, and for five states, we're actually not sure. A 1990 paper called Attacking the Busy Beaver 5 found a machine that runs for 47,176,870 steps and ends on 4,098 ones. And although we're pretty sure that machine's the winner for both score and maximum shifts, we still to this day haven't proven it. The issue is that there are over 16 trillion possible 5 state Turing machines, and although for most of them it's simple to determine when and if they hold, for some of them it's a pain in the ass. However, a community if effort is being undertaken to prove once and for all what the 5 state champion is, an effort that's narrowed the number of undecided machines down to just 34. If you're watching this video in the future, maybe the question has been solved, who knows? The 6 state winner runs for a lot more than 47 million steps. It runs for more than a Google or a Googleplex. In fact, we've managed to find a 6 state machine that can run for over 10 tetrated to the 15 steps, and this number may indeed be higher if a better machine is found in the future. In addition, a 9-state machine has been found with a score of 10 tetrated to the 28, a 10-state machine with a score of 10 tetrated to the 7.6 trillion, and an 11-state machine with a score of 10 pentated to the 720 trillion. The true winners for these states are likely much much larger, these are just the best we've found so far. By 16 states, the score already rises beyond Graham's number, and by 85 states, the score has been found to rise even beyond large Goodstein sequences. See, these functions don't work like anything we've looked at before. The busy beaver function and the maximum shifts function are both uncomputable, meaning they eventually grow larger than any computable function. That includes all the functions we've looked at so far, as well as any function defined using a recursive process, even ones far larger than the limits of our imagination. This also means that there will always be an infinite number of values of the busy beaver function that we will never be able to find the answer to. The busy beaver function grows unimaginable imaginably faster than anything else that came before it, meaning you can use it to define large number records that seem impossible to beat. We'll come back to that. For now, these are the current tables for known records of the two functions. It also includes some records for machines with more than two colours, or symbols you can use for each square, which provides a whole new dimension to the challenge. This is absolutely still an open competition. If you've got the skills and determination, you too might be able to break some of these records. I also recommend Mutual Information's The Boundary of Computation for another take on the subject, as well as what it really means to be uncomputable. Right, it's about time we move on to something different. The idea of floating point numbers has existed since the early 20th century, but it wasn't until 1985 that they were properly standardized in the IEEE 754 standard. Jan Miseli's video on floating point numbers is brilliant and explains the system in a much more natural way than I can, but we'll quickly sum up how it works. Since a bit in binary can be one of two values, a set of 64 bits allows for 2 to the power of 64 or 18 quintillion values, or up to 9 quintillion positive and negative if you spare a bit for the sign. This is known as a 64-bit integer. But you might want more precision than just whole numbers, and certainly you don't need as much precision when you're up at 9 quintillion, right? So let's define a method that gives more precision to smaller numbers. A typical 64-bit floating point number, or float, assigns 1 bit to the sign, 11 bits to the exponent, and the last 52 bits to the fraction, also known as the mantissa. The 11 exponent bits define a power of 2 between negative 1022 and 1023, and the 52 fraction bits determine a number between 1 and 2 to multiply it by. For example, if your exponent bits represented 2 to the power of 3, and your fraction bits represented 1.25, your 
number would be equal to 2 to the power of 3 times 1.25, which is 10. This type of number has some advantages over regular integers in that it can be used to represent precise fractions or small numbers, but it can also be used to represent very large numbers. The largest number representable using a 64-bit floating point number is around 1.8 times 10 to the power of 308. The IEEE 754 standard also lays out the specification for 128-bit floating point numbers, assigning them 15 exponent bits, allowing for numbers up to 10 to the power of 4932. And if that's not enough for you, it also specifies 256-bit floats, assigning them 19 exponent bits, allowing for numbers up to 10 to the power of 78913. To be exact, any floating point number with n bits for the exponent will allow for the expression of numbers up to the 2 to the power of 2 to the power of n minus 1. That's not bad. Unfortunately for developers looking to use these large numbers to make games, most major programming languages don't support floating points beyond 64 bits, meaning you can't use numbers larger than 10 to the power of 308. You can, however, create your own system for large numbers. In 2012, GitHub user Mike McCool created BigNumber.js, a JavaScript library that allows you to create a big number object that can represent numbers up to 10 to the power of a billion. This library later evolved into Decimal.js, which allowed for the handling of numbers up to 10 to the power of 9 quadrillion. This isn't too difficult to achieve, you can create a library like this by just having a second number to represent the exponent of your number, and then adding some calculations so that you can perform math operations on them. A few years later in 2017, Padishu released BreakInfinity.js, a more performance-focused alternative to Decimal designed specifically for incremental games. A few years after that, Break Eternity was created, allowing for the handling of numbers as large as 10 tetrated to 10 to the power of 308. This was then expanded upon further with Naruyoko's Omega Num, which could go into the F1000 range. Finally, in February 2020, Expantinum was released, which reached a staggering F omega plus 1 of 9 quadrillion, the largest number a JavaScript library has been able to handle to date. Although it would be possible to create a larger library, there just aren't that many use cases for numbers as large as Expantinum. Can you name any games with numbers that large? So there isn't much demand to create anything bigger at the moment. Also, Expantinum isn't very fast. In order to handle numbers of all sizes, it needs to store a lot of information, which means it calculates a lot slower than smaller libraries like Break Infinity. However, it is still possible that we may see a larger library in the future. Clearly we just need to start making games with larger numbers. In December 2001, mathematician David Mose hosted the Big Num Bake Off, a competition where the goal was to write a C program in 512 characters or less that returns the largest possible number, assuming a computer with infinite time and infinite memory. A total of 21 programs were submitted to the contest, of which only 15 actually outputted a large number under the rules. Let's take a look at some of these programs and how they worked. Three entries attempt to generate a largest possible integer by using unsigned types, which doesn't work under the rules. One of the entries attempts to write a recursive function to generate a large number, but due to an error the program never halts. Nine of the 21 entries were submitted by one man known only as Pete. The first two of Pete's entries, Pete.c and Pete2.c, are both attempts to loop until the largest integer is found, but since there is no largest integer, the programs never halt. The third attempt, Pete3.c, is a bit more interesting. It uses the left shift operation, which differs from normal mathematical functions in that it modifies the bits in the number directly. In this case, A left shifted by B is equivalent to A times 2 to the power of B for a machine with infinite memory. This program uses all 512 characters to perform 164 lift shifts, giving an output of around 10 to the power of 472. The program could have grown tetrationally, but unfortunately lift shifts are calculated left to right, not right to left. These three programs are super simple, I presume they were likely to test the rules or backups in case future programs didn't work. Pete4.c is a lot more advanced, it builds a recursive function and uses it to create a number at the level of around f omega times 33, a considerable improvement. Pete5, Pete6 and Pete7 all use arrays in order to produce a large result. These programs grow at around f omega to the 11th, f omega to the 23rd and f omega to the omega respectively. 
P8 and P9 were intended to be further improvements, but unfortunately they both contain the same bug and output much smaller numbers. There are a few other less notable entries that use various methods. Ioannis.c defines a function equivalent to the Ackerman function, and Chan.c defines a similar function that grows a lot faster. The second largest entry submitted to the contest is Markson.c, which uses a variation of the Goodstein sequences. Although the exact output size is undetermined to this day, Mose claims it to have an upper bound of f epsilon naught plus omega cubed of a million. The winning entry, loader.c, is staggeringly large. The program implements a parser, type checker, interpreter, and proof search for COC, the calculus of constructions, and it implements all of this in under 512 characters. Cock is a mathematical language that has two neat features. First, it can be expressed through code, as Ralph Loader does in his program, and second, any valid statement written and interpreted in this language will eventually terminate. This means the program won't make statements that run forever. Loader's program creates a function dx that goes over all bit strings with a value less than or equal to x, and if such a bit string creates a well-formed statement in COC, it runs that statement and collects the value of the result. It then adds all these values together to create the final return value for d. The program has just enough space after all the code to return d of d of d of d of d of 99. The output of this program is mind-bogglingly enormous. d of x is roughly the equivalent of saying what is the sum of all possible outputs from statements in this language up to length x. d of 99 is known to be equal to at least 10 tetrated to 30,419. And since there exists a paper that explains how to create programs at the level of f epsilon naught in a relatively short number of characters, d of d of 99 is guaranteed to surpass the output of Markson's program. Therefore, Loader's impressive handling of his cock makes him the winner. One other interesting thing to note is that although the output of Loader.c is insanely large, it's still computable, meaning that large values of the busy beaver function do still surpass it. A familiar face is returning to greet us again. Wanna guess who it is? That's right, it's Jonathan Bowers. We'll get back to him in a minute. In 1996, in the same book where Conway and Guy published their extended names for Ilian numbers, they also presented a unique notation for expressing large numbers. Chained arrow notation, an extension of up arrow notation that can reach f omega squared. Six years later, inspired by a book section on hyperoperators he had read as a child, Bowers devised a four input system similar to chained arrow notation, which he then developed into an array notation that can take any number of inputs. The original system uses a slightly more complicated but similar set of rules to chained arrow notation, but is much stronger. In fact, the limit of chained arrow notation f omega squared is equivalent to the limit of just four entries in array notation. With five entries you can reach f omega cubed, and the limit with any number of entries is f omega to the omega. Later that same year, Bowers extended the notation into extended array notation, or bean. Since the obvious next step after the limit of a one-dimensional array is to continue into higher dimensions, this extension defines a new type of separator to denote multi-dimensional arrays, effectively recursionifying over the previous array notation. The one separator denotes a new row, making the array two-dimensional, the two separator denotes a new plane, making the array three-dimensional, and so on up to the higher dimensions. The limit of this dimensional space is f omega to the omega to the omega, over the next few years, Bowers would extend his notation even further, first with tetrational arrays, then pentational arrays, then legion arrays. Keep in mind, tetrational arrays grow a lot faster than tetration. In this case, tetrational represents the space beyond dimensional space. Unfortunately, however, it was later shown that the definitions for the notation beyond tetrational arrays don't have any clear working interpretation, and are thus ill-defined. This places the limit for the well-defined portion of array notation at f epsilon naught, and to this day, developing a notation that fits Bowers' rules in a well-defined way is still an open problem. 
Ideas are being thrown around though. However, after Bowers' innovations, a few other people developed their own ideas for array notations. In April 2006, Chris Bird, a friend of Bowers, released a 78-page paper detailing his own array notation, fittingly called Bird's Array Notation. This notation shares a lot of similarities with Bowers' array notation, but it has the added bonus of being well-defined beyond the level of epsilon naught. The definitions were improved over the next few years, up until 2013, with additional sections added allowing the notation to reach even further. The current limit of Bird's notation is a that. Hold on, let's refer to our scale to see how impressed we should be. Wow, that's big. What does any of this mean? What does or doesn't count as a valid large number? If you asked me to define the biggest number I could, and I said the largest number any human will ever define plus one, would you count that? Probably not, and mathematicians wouldn't either, for two reasons. First of all, the largest number any human will ever define plus one would then become the largest number any human will ever define, meaning it would be equal to itself plus one, which is a paradox. This specific paradox is known as the Berry Paradox. Second, and more importantly, it's not something we can quantify. It's too vague to give a solid definition, and it relies on information that is unknowable. The same goes for responses like a gorbazillion, or the largest number you could possibly define in a thousand English words. These numbers don't have clear definitions, and we can't give them clear definitions, so they cannot have a value attached to them. That means these numbers are ill-defined. This will be important later, so keep it in mind. In January 2007, Augustine Ryo of MIT and Adam Elgo of Princeton got together to have a duel to see who could come up with the biggest number. This event was appropriately named the Big Number Duel, and the rules were simple. The two would take turns writing numbers on a board. Each entry must be larger than the last, no infinite or ill-defined numbers, and importantly, no semantics. Definitions must be rigid and definable, instead of phrases like this refer to or this is named as, preventing a competitor from defining their number as their opponent's largest number plus one. The last person who can come up with a valid number that's larger than the last wins. Ryo went first, he started by writing down a sequence of 41s. Elga, in response, went over to Ryo's board with an eraser, and removed a section from most of the ones, leaving this, an 11 followed by 38 factorials. Ryo immediately pulled out the big guns, calling upon the immenseness of the busy beaver function and defining busy beaver of a Google as his next entry. So that's it, right? Well, the following few entries came about by envisioning more powerful generalizations of a Turing machine. An example of this is an Oracle Turing machine, which is a Turing machine equipped with an imaginary oracle that can instantly determine whether a regular Turing machine halts or not. This more powerful Turing machine could be used to make what we'll call BB1 of a Google. Of course, the Oracle Turing machine can get its own oracle that can be used to make an even more powerful Turing machine, which can then be used to define BB2, then BB3, and so on. And this could even be recursed on with BB Omega, BB Omega plus one, and so on and so on. The final entry of the Busy Beaver series was BB Theta of a Google, where Theta is defined as the first non-recursive ordinal, according to Ryo. It's unclear what he meant by this specifically, it's likely he's referring to the church clean ordinal, but it's no matter, because it was about to be blown away by what would become the winning entry. Ryo defined his grandest entry in the following way. The smallest number, with the property of being larger than any number that can be named in the language of first order set theory using a Google symbols or less. For those not in the know, set theory is a branch of mathematics concerning sets of objects and how they interact. The language of set theory is the series of symbols used to formally construct sets, and first order set theory refers to set theory using the symbols of first order logic. And that's all well and good, but there's an issue with this definition, it uses semantics. It doesn't have a rigid definition, so is this actually not a valid entry in the competition? Well, the true description used during the duel was a lot more specific. 
Ryo wrote down the full proper definition for first order set theory using second order mathematical language, making the definition precise and rigid. The result is a number beyond even the possibilities of the busy beaver function, since it utilizes the more powerful language of set theory instead of the simpler Turing theory that busy beavers are based on. Ryo later noted that the second order set theory he used to define his number could also theoretically be described with a third order language, allowing for the creation of an even larger version. But either way, as of 2007, Ryo's number was the largest defined number of all time. Two other major events happened over the next year. First, the Googology Wiki was created as a central encyclopedia for all large numbers. And second, just four days later, chronic essay writer Spiz Sabian released his worldwide website all about Googology, where he also shared a major new notation. It's just all a lot to get into. I think it's best if we just speed through to the modern day. It's the modern day. A lot of stuff has happened in the past decade, so I'm just going to blow through a few things that are important to modern Googleology, but are either too complicated for me to understand or too complicated to explain in the scope of this video. Lightning round! In 1998, Harvey Friedman created the Block Subsequence Theorem, a relatively powerful graph-related function with a growth rate of f omega to the omega. Later in 2006, he created the Tree Function and the Subcubic Graph Function, both graph-based functions that grow extremely quickly. You might have heard of the tree function already, number file did a few videos on it. Later again in 2009, Friedman defined finite promise games and greedy clique sequences, which grow even faster. To this day, they are some of the largest and most poorly understood computable functions ever devised. Inspired by the Goodstein sequences, in 1982 Laurie Kirby and Jeff Paris created the Hydra game, a single player game that gives rise to a function on par with Goodstein at f epsilon naught. Later around 2002, this game evolved into a list-like form known as Beklemyshev's Worms, which Japanese Googleologist Bashasu then developed into the primitive sequence system in 2014. Bashasu and his pairs managed to fully unlock the potential of Goodstein likes later that year by extending the array to two rows, known as the pair sequence system. Despite only adding an extra row, the system now extended all the way up to hair on the ordinal scale, just below the limit of birds arrays. So what happens if you extend it to three rows? The pair sequence system soon evolved into Bashasu matrix system, which can handle any number of rows. And the limit of three row BMS is so large we don't even know how large it is. Even just this three row array transcends the limit of the notation we're using for the top of the scale. BMS is expected to be one of the fastest growing computable functions around today, along with Y sequence, another descendant of the primitive sequence system. BMS is still being actively researched, and it's likely that developing our understanding of the way these notations grow will also further the understanding of Googleology as a whole. So that's one of the big things going on. Uh, you know what, fuck it, here's a list of all the stuff I haven't explained yet. <laughs> Yeah, there's more too. The early 2010s were when Googleology as a community really hit the mainstream. When you look today, more and more people are making their own notations, sharing their knowledge and expanding the wiki. And people are doing it for the sake of large numbers. For a lot of the early developments, the Ackerman function, Goodstein sequences, Graham's number, the large number aspect was always a side effect of some other purpose. Most progress in the area was being done by people who didn't actually care about large numbers. It makes sense. Googleology isn't important to anything in the real world, for most it's just a curiosity. So you'd expect it to always be an afterthought, but more and more people are starting to put real effort into developing it. I think the internet has been a big part of that change. There's a whole host of videos on YouTube introducing new people to the various concepts of Googleology, some of which I've linked to in this video, and people love it because we love large numbers. A lot of it is nigh incomprehensible, yes, but there's so much to learn that's palatable but still interesting. We've kind of been dancing around the big question. It's probably been on your mind. What is the largest number? Of course, you can always add one. There is no largest number, but we've seen that certain systems eventually dominate most others. From the Googleologist point of view, the largest number would be a relatively large input into an extremely fast growing function. The state of the art, so to speak. So what is the fastest growing function? What is the state of the art?
The date is December 3rd, 2019. Japanese Googleologist Pishin Daisukebot, most commonly known for his focus on formality, makes a blog post laying out the definition for a very large number. It is given this comically gargantuan name, which roughly translates as follows. Come on friends, the large number garden is finally complete. Let me explain the function of this garden. The first is the determination function of the address in the floor plan. When a character string is read, it automatically determines which miniature garden address it represents, and in which miniature garden the floor plan of a large number garden can be reproduced. The second is the floor plan analysis function. If you specify the address of the miniature garden and read the floor plan of the reproducible large number garden there, it will tell you the large number that the garden can produce. The third important function is the ability to generate larger numbers. Once a natural number is entered, all character strings within the upper limit of the number of characters are searched, and each is read into the address and a floor plan determination function, leaving only the reproducible floor plan for each miniature garden. By enumerating them and loading them into the analysis function of the floor plan, you can obtain the large numbers that they can produce, and by putting the them all together, you can create new large numbers. Huh? Can you really get a large number with that? As usual, my ally is skeptical, but hey, here's the floor plan for the large number garden itself. If you load this into the analysis function, it will tell you how large numbers you can generate. Huh? How many characters does this floor plan have? What's the use of knowing such things? If you're short on time, you can just call it the large number garden number. I wish I could explain exactly how this number is defined, but unfortunately it's beyond me. It's loosely related to the definition for Ryo's number, albeit far more complicated. In fact, we can't even be sure if it's actually well defined or not. Since nobody's been able to prove it's not well defined, it effectively stands as the largest defined number of all time, as long as you don't count trivial extensions like adding one to it or multiplying it by itself. The number was created relatively recently, all things considered, so it's likely that Googleology will see a future with even larger numbers. And the rate of progress is astounding now. It is reminiscent of the way we've come technologically as a species. The original story of the Tower of Babel, from the Book of Genesis, was likely written between 1400 and 900 BC. It describes a tower reaching so high it threatened to pierce the heavens themselves. Historical claims of its height vary wildly, from less than 100 meters to tens of kilometers high. But there is a real building the story was likely inspired by, the Atemenanki in Babylon. It was one of many ziggurats, massive ancient temples constructed out of Earth, of which the Atemenanki was one of the tallest. But modern sources place it at only around 66 meters tall, less than half the height of the contemporary Great Pyramid of Giza. The temples built in ancient times would have seemed immense to the people who saw them, worthy of inspiring stories of reaching the heavens. But looking back today, we see them from a different perspective. This is the unimaginable Tower of Babel, this is what they thought would bring them to heaven. It's impressive, yes, but look at what we have now, look how high we can reach, how fast we're improving. Surely now we must be approaching the gods, surely now we must be reaching the infinite. It's me again, hello. Thank you for sticking through to the end. If you enjoyed this, leave a like. If you didn't, uh, leave a dislike, I guess. And if you'd like to support my future endeavors, consider checking out my Patreon. I make no money from this video, and I would like to make more videos in the future. I also make games too, you can find them at my website along with some other math stuff. 
A lot of the inspiration to make a longer essay type video came from Solar Sands' Monumentality, which is easily one of my all time favourite long form YouTube videos. It covers grand scale and the endless human desire for expansion, and it showcases a bunch of really interesting works. If you enjoyed this video I'd highly recommend checking it out, even if it is as long of a watch as this was. I want to give a big thank you to Robert Munafo, Spiz Sabian, Jonathan Bowers and The Big Psy Project for their sights on large numbers. The information was super valuable, I learned a ton from them while making this. I also want to thank Kotaitan for his Google Maps page, I like the pun, and Fish for his assistance with some of the history aspects. The sources for this video will be linked in the description, and this script will get a written form at some point too, that'll also get a link. And finally, I want to thank you, the viewer, for tolerating my rambling. Take care.